Mr. Bill Higley has, got, has our gross showcase. Mr. Bill Higley is an attorney with Aegis Law. He concentrates his practice on general business and corporate matters, estate planning, and not-for-profit organizations. His top topic this morning is legal auditing. I give you Mr. Bill Higley. I know I was announced as legal auditing, but I came uh, here prepared to talk about licensing. <laughs> and so, um, and I think that, that probably uh, says that on the, uh, on the, on the paper. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's, let's try this. There we go. All right. Okay. So, um, so uh, uh, just one follow-on here to uh, what Brian said. It's one of my favorite stories of infringement, and many of you may know about this. Well, two of them, actually. One is, um, some of you may know Jim McLaren uh, in town here. He's a genetic consultant, and uh, he's from Scotland. And, uh, and he started uh, his consulting firm after he left, left Monsanto, and he named it Inverizon. Inverizon is derived from a Scottish word, which means new vistas, new, new things, new experiences. Well, he got in trouble with Verizon Phone Company, even though he had his trademark registered and fully registered, absolutely fully registered. And so um, uh, they had a lawsuit uh, here in town, and he eventually um, changed, his, uh, changed his name. So maybe they bought him out of the place, but, but um, even there, uh, they thought that there was a likelihood of confusion between the two. The other one that I think is a hoot is you're familiar with the, uh, the, the clothing manufacturer, the North Face, mm -hmm. okay? So they have this, this um, uh, three things that come like this, okay? So some years ago, there was a kid from Ladue High School. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have his jacket. Oh, you have a jacket? I have one, yes. And so this yeah. kid came up with, infringing with the, uh, the trademark, the South Butt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they manufactured these things. Yeah. Instead of it going this way, theirs went this way. But it was <laughs> on the other side, too. Oh, it, it, it was, was on the other side. It was the opposite of everything. It was the opposite yeah. of everything, and it yeah. was the South Butt, okay? And so, yeah, and you could buy these things. They yes. were in stores. They had it manufactured. Richard has one. And um, they're no longer in store. <laughs> <laughs> so I can only presume there was some kind of a, some kind of a. Um, but he uh, got bought out. He got a nice. He got a nice settlement on that. Yes, he did. Yeah. 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 So there's, there you go. That's better than a summer job stacking up clothes at, uh, uh, at. Uh, uh, yeah. Anywhere. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, licenses and um, licensing. We're going to talk about licenses and licensing today. And licenses and licensing always brings to mind my favorite story about Socrates. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> the father of Western philosophy. Um, all Western philosophy is uh, but a footnote to Socrates. Martin Heidegger said, and Martin Heidegger himself was no slouch as a philosopher. And so um, for Socrates, though, Socrates never wrote anything. He never published anything. Never, for him, philosophy was a matter of the peripatetic uh, experience in the marketplace, and it's spontaneous, and it was, and he conducted his, his, his sessions in the marketplace um, in uh, terms of questions. And so we have today the Socratic method, which is named for the, uh, the way he taught philosophy. It was an iterative process of drawing out questions, asking questions. Well, you see in the picture there, there's a book, what looks like a book, on the ground. So Socrates didn't write that, but his student Plato did. Plato wrote the Dialogues of Plato. And you can, you can buy them today, the Dialogues of Plato. And the ironic thing about the Dialogues of Plato, they read like a play script. You read this, and Plato doesn't appear in them. Plato's not in the Dialogues of Plato. They're called the Dialogues of Plato. They're in the public domain. 
there, uh, but Plato's not in there. Socrates is. It's all about Socrates, all about what Socrates said. So you can imagine Socrates' surprise when one day he shows up at the marketplace and he sees his student there, Plato. And Plato is selling these books. <laughs> and he's making a killing. <laughs> and Socrates goes up and he goes, this is my stuff. This is my stuff. What are you doing? This is my stuff. And Plato, okay, you know, he's, he's doing just fine here. You know? <laughs> and he saw the opportunity. Okay? And so, of course, predictably, they end up in court before Judge Judy. Right. <laughs> Here's Judge Judy, okay? And they're arguing, all right? And Judge Judy says, Sock, you're SOL. You can't protect ideas. You cannot protect ideas. He wrote them down so he can protect his books. But you can't protect your idea. And that's because an idea is not intellectual property. A book is. So you reduce the idea to an embodiment, a form, an expression. Maybe your idea is a book. Maybe your idea is a design of furniture. Maybe your idea is um, a process. That is, that's property. Property exists in space and time. Ideas don't. And so, so they, they are uh, in front of Judge Judy, and she says, you can't protect your ideas, but he can protect his books. And if you want to use any of your stuff, you can license it from Plato. Who put it in books? <laughs> your own stuff. That's what you got to do. Right. And so, so when we think of licenses and licensing, just in terms of some preliminaries, ideas of uh, cannot be, uh, ideas can't be licensed as protected. They're not property. So the purpose of a license is definition of what's being protected and protection for that property. That's the, that's the, uh, the, 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 the reason for, for having a license. So we just had a presentation on um, uh, trademarks. So trademarks are an example of what can be licensed. So that you'll see all the time in software. Software goes through and it's got your license to use the software. And then the license says, and, and it talks about embedded software that's it's in there. And then it says um, uh, Microsoft and Google and, and whatever else, Windows and all that, are the trademarks separate trademarks uh, of those entities to whom they belong and they are licensed for use in this, in this software. So, um, so a license is a legally binding contract. It's, it defines permission and the ownership remains with the creator. So for any of you who develop intellectual property and you want to give permission to someone else to use it or you want to commercially exploit it, a license is the key to that. A license defines who can do what with what. So rights for use and distribution are laid out in the license and use here of the intellectual property includes economic exploitation and distribution to sub-licensees or sub-licenses. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So the parties are typically called the licensor and that's the person who owns the intellectual property and the licensee, the person who gets to use it, or gets to exploit it, or gets to uh, rent, or gets to, uh, to make some commercial use. So the critical elements are the identification of the parties, the description of the intellectual property, and the parameters of the permission. So what is, who's doing this, what, are the, what is it all about, what are the, what's the, the intellectual property, and what are the parameters? So examples of parameters of the permission are the purposes, uh, time limitation, whether you can extend this into uh, for all time or it's for a definite period of time or for a year, 
or for some other time limitation, uh, place or geographic limits. Um, you could, like a distributorship contract, in other words, analogous to that, you could sell it here, but you can't sell it over there. You can license it, you can use it here, but you can't use it there. Um, you can sell to these people, but you can't sell to those people. Now that's assuming you don't have any tr antitrust problems or anything like that, but, but it defines uh, the purpose. Price and revenue, whether there is price, whether there's a price for this, whether it is a non-revenue license. So some licenses are not concerned with revenue, they're just concerned with defining who owns this. And to this licensee, it's a non-revenue, or for this purpose, it's a non-revenue uh, transaction. But for other purposes, other licensees, uh, under other circumstances, it may be indeed a revenue, a revenue license. And then sub-licensing or not. So I'll uh, give you an example of a sub-license from, from my practice. Jim McLaren and I actually worked on a whole series of licensees for the National Corn Growers Association years ago. And they developed starch chemistry. Corn is starch. And so starch chemistry. And they developed technology uh, around um, uh, catalysts, uh, catalysts, chemical catalysts. And they licensed that to universities. And universities then developed commercially um, uh, viable products, and then the universities could sublicense this to, say, Cargill or to some other manufacturer. So the license, the original license, was from National Corn Growers to the university, but in that agreement it said, oh yes, you can, you can sublicense this to somebody else. So that meant that if another manufacturer come, came along and they used it, they would be violating the terms of that sub-license and they would, they would be infringing on that. Um, so that it, so it really defines the, the scope of the, of the usage. Um, what could go wrong with these things? First of all, the, the variety of licenses, they're, they're as broad as commercial contracts generally. And so for, there are all kinds of licenses, and there are licenses for software, and licenses for recordings, and licenses for music. You see at the end of uh, movies in the credits, you see the clearances, okay, and all those songs are played, so the clearances, and so the, the, that's clearances of the licenses and the intellectual property, you get clearance, you get approval to use that. Um, otherwise, it's an infringement on their uh, trademark, copyright, uh, their uh, rights in the creation of the intellectual property. It is true, going back to our situation with Socrates, he's a creator. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, going back to with Socrates and Plato, Plato is the creator of the intellectual property, and it's his, under the law. He or she who creates owns. Okay? So this is a problem with employment situation because people assume that if you employ a person, whatever they create is yours, no, it's not. You have to have a separate contract. Um, so disputes over terms, infringement, second or third party uh, infringement, like in the National Corn Growers situation, the, the third party might be the manufacturer. They can infringe on it. Exceeding the scope of a license, we licensed it for use in this situation, but uh, <coughs> it's, um, uh, they're using it for, uh, 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 they've expanded the, the situation. Um, and then payment and revenue. All the usual, the typical payment and revenue. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to define how are you gonna, what, what's the, the monetizing event? Okay, a client of mine had educational software and uh, they licensed, the revenue there was defined by butts in the seats, how many students. Another situation might define it by how many times it's used for a presentation, regardless of the number of, 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 of students. <coughs> so there's, there's different ways. In the, uh, the chemical uh, license, uh, that license was premised on, the revenue was premised on the number of pounds of ultimate product. Could have been premised on the uh, commission on sales. All sorts of different ways to, to uh, decide um, uh, to decide the uh, licensing. So must-haves in a license agreement. 
Uh, you've got to have a precise definition of the property. You've got to think through possible derivations. Well, if you license this, suppose they take chapters two and three and four of your book and put it in a book of their own, and they modify it a little. You know, is that a problem? You know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. But you've got to think through possible derivations. If you derivations comes up in patents, uh, so you invent a mousetrap, somebody has a better mousetrap. Is it still a mousetrap, and is it within the scope of your patent? Right? Uh, define the revenue collection plan. You've got to think this through and make it precise. And then, as always, the bottom line, and this is true with trademarks, get professional help. Professional help uh, on balance uh, is really cheap for the value you get, especially in an area like this where the, the economic consequences can be so enormous. Uh, it is um, get professional help. So. Questions? <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> right, I'm going to go around the room this way first. John. You talk about competition. Years ago, my dad had a patent on his, he had a curtain manufacturing plant. And he developed a tenfold, which was <coughs> old <coughs> the corners and sort of drapery of the curtains so that it would hang straight. He got sued by Monsanto, who was in the business of metals. And they sued my dad for uh, patent infringement. My dad ended up winning back then. It was $25,000 in legal fees, but that was in 1912. <laughs> Two hundred fifty thousand now in today's dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Scope of the property, their definition of the intellectual property, totally critical. Um, I have a client who developed a, um, uh, speaking of draperies, uh, a mechanism for hanging those hospital curtains that go around emergency room beds and examining beds and stuff like this, to facilitate rapid removal and replacement for cleaning. Yes. Yeah, is it uh, appropriate or can it be done that you, in the issuing a license, dictate the pricing? If they sub so the licensee has to charge a certain amount, say it's an educational oh. program, mm -hmm. so that they don't diminish the perception of value by reducing right. the price on it? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, yes you can. Uh, you do get into some antitrust considerations there as to how far you can dictate the, uh, the price. Uh, but um, the uh, one, way to, uh, one way to address that is to make the uh, licensee pay a license, pay a, a fee to the licensor for every sub-license. Uh -huh. So that goes into their cost of Doing business. Okay. So that, that's one way to address that. Yes. Um, I want to see if I, if I understand this correctly. Uh, th this is an oversimplification, I'm sure. So it sounds like a trademark is protecting your, your, your brand or your name, whereas a uh, license is protecting your method. Um, my, I'm going to say yes, both. Uh, because uh, the license, uh, trademarks are licensed every day, all the time. Um, a business method is something that can be patented, right? Um, and your method, if it's reduced to writing and it's in a book, if you write a book about hypnosis, for example, uh, hypnotherapy, uh, what's in the book and the book can be protected, the ideas can be. Many times people say, well, I've got a great idea for a novel. I'm going to write a great American novel. I've got this. This is absolutely new. You know? And I'm afraid somebody, if I talk to somebody about it, they're going to steal it and make a movie out of it. 
So one way, it would suggest to expect that is you write it up in a detailed summary, and you have that summary copyrighted. Okay. It's because those ideas as expressed in that summary are copyrighted. Thank you. Right. Yeah, where do you get those wonderful images? <laughs> oh, that's from uh, Copilot. It's all in the prompt. It's, it's, I want to say it's it's ridiculously simple, okay, but it's as easy as hitting a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's every twentieth one will be great. What's that? Every twentieth one will be great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little bit of practice, you know, in this. Okay, I did have a neighbor in U City years ago, and this was their license plate. Okay. Poetic license. Yeah, I should have put the outtakes at the end of your presentation. The what? The outtakes. The what? The outtakes. Oh, the outtakes. Oh, yeah. I've got a bunch of outtakes here, and I think we, um, I think we ditched them, did we? Are they in the, in the? They're not on the uh, included in the file. It was in here. Yeah, because because um, Copilot gives you, or at least my experience was, it gives you four images. Uh, you know, Better like that, an AI. On that cool. same. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's like Dolly AI. AI. That's what it is. Chat GPT, um, Chat GPT, and more yeah. Dolly. You know, yeah. and that's you know, I'm I'm just a novice. I'm playing around with it. And it's, it's wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what kind of questions could we ask? Uh, um, qualifying questions to a lawyer that we ask so we don't get some sort of uh, we get on the right path. How time. much have you done this? How much have you done? This? Have you done this before? What's your experience? Um, and um, uh, the, the most efficient way is to, to go with a specialist, go with, with someone who specializes in the, uh, in the area. Uh, with software and other things that are packaged, sometimes you have what's commonly called a shrink wrap license. And that is a license where there's shrink wrap, shrink wrap plastic around the package. And if you open the shrink wrap, then you're deemed to have accepted the contract for the license. Great to hear about it. Uh, time is up. All right. Thanks, folks. I appreciate it.